I've been expecting you. Good to see you, everyone. My name is Robbie Howell. I am a tabletop game designer, a lover of history, and a lifelong player of Age of Empires II. And in this series, Theory Crafting, I take a look at civilizations and units not yet present in AoE2 and give my best shot at designing a historically grounded and mechanically interesting framework that they might actually operate on if they were to be added into the game as we know it today. For this episode, I direct your attention to the poll on screen Screen. Who do you see winning that by a pretty substantial amount? Yes, sirree, we're going to be going to East Africa today. Specifically about midway down the eastern coast, what now crosses several different countries. You guys all said that you wanted it. A lot of people have said they weren't sure how this civilization could actually be put together. And overall, I would definitely agree that we need a little bit more Africa in our lives in Age of Empires too. And so, without further ado, I present to you today... The Swahilis. Yes, indeed, the Swahilis. Unlike many other African countries and cultures, these ones were not actually that hard to research once I got my hands on a couple of nice sources. And as always, if you want to take a look at those, as well as a comprehensive overview of the civilization, including a full tech tree, details on all the unique units and technologies and similar, take a look at the comprehensive civilization document linked down in the description. If you want any disclaimers or insight on my philosophy when approaching these builds, take a look on screen now. And assume you don't, let's dive into Swahili history. So when we are referring to the Swahilis, we are referring to an ethnic group that crosses a band of coastline ranging from around the southern coast of modern Somalia all the way down into what is now modern Mozambique. That has seen the rise and fall of some of the most powerful independent city-states in Africa, as well as in many ways the entire world. But we are mostly looking at around 900 AD as a starting point, though that isn't to say that the Swahili coast was not populated before them. It certainly was. Apparently there is some archaeological evidence of Roman and Byzantine goods in these early Swahili cities, specifically on the island of Zanzibar way back in the 500s, but things really start to come into picture more clearly once Islam came sweeping in. Uh, Arab traders coming from up north brought their religion and their wares down and found plenty of valuable things to trade for, eventually leading to the first true Swahili city-state, namely Kambalu, in about 900 AD. Ruled by an Arab merchant elite and populated by many different local African peoples, though over time these groups would commingle, founding what we would eventually know today as the true Swahili genealogy. But Kambalu was certainly not the only Swahili Swahili city-state, though it was the first. Many others soon followed, including the very powerful state of Kilwa, for sure the most prominent of all the Swahili city-states, and it has a fairly interesting origin story. Apparently, a group of Persian nobles fleeing the downfall of their homeland came rushing down into Somalia, got booted out of there, made their way further south, eventually arriving at the island of Kilwa Kisiwani and buying it from a local African ruler to then found the Shirazi dynasty that would go on to rule Kilwa for centuries. Now, many people thought this was absolute bunk. It sounds like a very far-fetched and kind of too convenient story, likely a way for the local African peoples to establish legitimacy in the eyes of other Muslims. Oh no, we're not Africans, we're actually Persian nobility, don't you know? But it has recently come out, and I saw a couple of conflicting sources on this, that there may be actual genetic evidence that this Persian story is true. Uh, again, I have articles on both sides linked in my sources, so take a look at that if you're interested in learning more about this very interesting topic. But let's move beyond Kilwa and some of the other more specific Swahili city-states. Like I said, there were many, and they were all very powerful, and they quickly began to establish these incredibly elaborate trade networks, primarily sourcing sub-Saharan African goods up north into Muslim lands, from there to be distributed out across the rest of the known world. But it wasn't just the Muslims. There were 
obviously other North African peoples like the Ethiopians, as well as many Indian traders who would make their way all the way across the ocean to get to the Swahili coast to trade for the incredible wares on offer. It is said that Swahili goods were found all the way from England to China, a span of literally half the world, all sourced from these 12-ish major city-states along this one span of African coastline, which is just mind-boggling when you think about it in the context of the medieval world. What the heck were these guys selling that was so valuable? Well, a lot of things they were selling were so valuable, the big one being slaves, of course, but they did have quite a lot of gold as well, and more importantly than possibly either of those two, they had cash crops. They had rare woods like ebony and sandalwood. I believe they had pretty substantial cotton plantations as well, along with things like perfume and pearls and stuff that you really couldn't get anywhere else. That being said, with such wealth comes problems. Piracy was rampant. And it wasn't just from fellow Africans. No, no, no. The Arabs, the Indians, and even the Madagascar natives, the Malagasy, all got in on it, plundering whatever Swahili ships they could find in search of valuable cargo. And not only that, but they also had to deal with land raids from African peoples like the Masai and the Oromo. These peoples weren't really as used to ships, but Swahili city-states were very, very juicy prizes, and their defenses were tested on a great many occasions. On the map, I obviously have the Malagasy represented by the Polynesians, and these African peoples as the Soninke, both of whom are very inaccurate, but consider those placeholders for now until I make more proper civilizations for these two diaspora. And so the Swahili are besieged by land and sea, and even though their precious cargo was taken from them in many different instances, they still became very, very wealthy, and attracted a whole lot of attention from the rest of the world. Even though they were in such a remote, far-flung place, people from all corners came to visit them to marvel at the beautiful civilizations they developed using their massive wealth. For example, ever heard of Zheng He? He was a famous Chinese admiral who, according to some legends, managed to sail as far as America, though that is very dubious, but what is known is he did visit the Swahili coast and was apparently greatly impressed with the quality of their cities, even comparing them to some of his native Chinese metropolises. Another one, Ibn Battuta, he was a Moroccan traveler who famously documented the Malian Empire, and he made his way to the Swahili coast as well, only staying for one night, but certainly leaving a good review of it on Yelp later. One Night in Mombasa by Ibn Battuta, five out of five stars. <laughs> and so despite the constant piracy and war, the Swahili states were doing very, very well for themselves, and their dominance grew substantially. They were never able to properly launch military expansion campaigns northwards, and they very rarely came into large-scale military conflict with other developed powers. But that was to change around the 1400s. During this time, many of the Swahili city-states started to fall into, not anarchy, but certainly a state of unrest. Powerful families started combating each other for power, states like Kilwa were usurped for many decades at a time, and into this state of flux sailed the good old Portuguese. We all know where this is going. I'm assuming you've played the Francisco de Almeida campaigns. All it took was one ambitious Portuguese admiral to destabilize the entire region in 1498. And destabilize it, he did. He certainly didn't destroy the Swahili states, though he did bring about the downfall of Kilwa, the greatest of them, and frequently played politics with some of the other powerful ones like Zanzibar and Mombasa, but he did largely bring an end to Swahili autonomy, and from that point, they were largely a pawn in the region rather than being the king. Many other European powers, such as the Dutch, came sailing through to try to establish a little bit of their own influence and peddle their wares. But also, not too long after, another great power, the Ottoman Turks, would come into the Indian Ocean. They and the Portuguese would fight fiercely over the Swahili coast pretty much right up until the end of the AOE2 relevant time frame, and well beyond that besides. The Swahilis were never defanged by any means. It's not like they were completely helpless. But in large part, they were proxies through which other empires fought their wars after about 1498. Even so, many Swahili cities remained incredibly beautiful and wealthy, valuable prizes for any marauding naval power passing through Africa, and with the stranglehold on trade that they once had, it only follows that they retained some level of trade dominance well into the 1800s, past the age of colonialism. 
And so where are they now? The Swahilis are still very much a cultural power in Eastern Africa. They are cohesive, but varied as a people, united by largely religion and language, but still incredibly different between the many different modern countries they find themselves in. While many of the once great Swahili cities have gone through their ups and downs over time, the many travel brochure results I got while Googling their modern incarnations would indicate that they're still doing pretty well today and certainly attract a fair few tourists to gawk at their beautiful natural splendor as well as their many glorious ruins of empires forgotten. And with that, let's move on to the flavor section. What thematic details might my Swahili build have in-game? Well, let's start with the architecture. It's African! Specifically with unique skins for the market, the dock, and the castle. Market and dock are very important buildings for the Swahilis, you'll see why shortly. Secondly, their language is going to be Kiswahili. Sikunyema, ladies and gentlemen. By all accounts I could find, this language is largely similar to how it probably would have sounded way back in the Middle Ages, but obviously more research would need to be done to make sure it was a faithful incarnation. And their wonder would be the great palace Husuni Kubwa. This beautiful white marble masterpiece was the jewel of the Swahili city-state of Kilwa and featured an octagonal swimming pool among many other luxurious amenities. What you see here is an artist's reconstruction of it. For AI player names, after getting some recommendations for people to take a look into these, I've came up with a couple. Unfortunately, most of them are rulers of Kilwa, since that is the Swahili city-state we know most about, but there's a little bit of variety in there. I'm not going to go through all of them because I think that would take quite a while, and all of them have a lot of really interesting history behind them, so if you'd like to take a look at my AI player names, take a look on screen right now, or take a look in the document where you will find them right above my sources. Let's move on to some campaigns. Beginning with what I think is the most obvious Swahili campaign candidate, that being Ali ibn al-Hassan. This legendary founder of the city-state of Kilwa was the original Persian prince, the founder of the Shirazi dynasty, who was chased all the way through Somalia to the island of Kilwa Kisiwani, which he then bought from an African prince, married his daughter, fortified the island, dug up the land bridge, and fought off the Africans when they decided, hmm, maybe we sold that to you for a little bit too cheap. Obviously, this story would have a lot of likely mythological elements to it, but we see that in the game right now with, for example, the Yodit campaigns. It's a cool story. There's a lot of different civilizations that could be included, everything from the Ethiopians to the Persians to the Saracens to even my Egyptian civilization. But I think there's another one that would be even more interesting to feature. That being Suleiman al-Hassan, or to give his full title, Suleiman ibn al-Hassan ibn Dawud. He was the 12th ruler of Kilwa, again part of the same Shirazi dynasty that Ali founded. And he is largely remembered as the greatest ruler of Kilwa and possibly the greatest ruler that the Swahili coast ever knew. Not only did he conquer a lot and managed to bring almost half of the great Swahili city-states under his control, but it was also he who brought Kilwa to the point where it was the undisputed crown of the region, surpassing its greatest rival Mogadishu, which prior to this had most certainly held that top spot. He also funded the construction of many of Kilwa's greatest buildings, including, I believe, the Husuni Kubwa I mentioned earlier, and was largely responsible for turning the city into the bustling wealthy metropolis that it was known to be through the rest of the Middle Ages. What else can I say? It's a great story of conquest and success, and I think it deserves to be a campaign. Let's move on to some potential appearances that the Swahilis could have in existing campaigns. It's Francisco de Almeida, obviously. And maybe Yodit, if you wanted to add a little bit of variety. I know they have a couple of, like, throwaway civilizations that they're usually using the Saracens for, so you could maybe put the Swahilis there. But other than that, not really anything good, unfortunately. I do have some other campaign ideas for you. These ones are a little bit weirder. Again, unfortunately, these are all centered around Kilwa. This is the only one of the great Swahili city-states I was able to find any historical story arcs for. So please forgive me for leaving many of the other great city-states out of the picture. I would love to feature campaigns in Zanzibar and Mogadishu and Mombasa, but I just couldn't find anything on them. So if you know any good stories from the region that could make for good campaigns, please point me to them down in the comments section below with sources if you can link them. But yeah, moving on to some other campaign ideas, let's begin with the Kitab al-Sulwa. 
This is the family story of the Shirazi dynasty. This would effectively be a series of vignettes following a couple centuries of Shirazi dynasty rulers, starting with Ali, featuring Suleiman, of course, but also several of the other lesser known figures of the dynasty. It could add for a little bit more variety and make it so that you don't have to stick on a single protagonist as much, which I know a lot of people like, but in cases like this, where the history is a little more scant, it might make for a bit more of an easy campaign from a design perspective. Like, you have more material to work with. But that's a little bit lame. I'd like to point you to what I'm calling a game of emirs and viziers. I'm going to be looking at my notes a lot for this one because, wow, it's confusing. So, let's see if I can summarize. 32nd ruler of Kilwa. He's not fantastic and he's challenged by a usurper. His two strongest advisors, a guy called Emir Muhammad and another guy called Vizier Suleiman, help him effectively humiliate the usurper and make him no longer a threat. But in so doing, gathers so much public support that they are effectively able to do a joint coup and take over Kilwa for themselves. What follows is like 50 years of constant usurpation where all sorts of emirs and viziers and other powerful families and the sons of the original two are just stealing the throne of Kilwa from each other constantly. Backstabbing, drama, intrigue, the usurper that they humiliated actually comes back to serve as the vizier to one of the two guys who humiliated him. It's just a wild piece of history and it could make for a very, very fun campaign. You would mostly be playing villains here. I know people don't always like that and more importantly, it's really complicated and we don't really know a ton about it. So it could make for a cool political drama if someone's ever ambitious enough to do something like that in Age of Empires. I know it can be done, but definitely not as clean of a campaign as someone like Suleiman al-Hassan would be. But now that we have all the flavor covered, let's rumble on to major themes. Some overarching trends that I found within Swahili history that greatly informed my design for them in this build. First one, say it with me friends, trade and wealth. Wow, these guys were important. They were one of the largest trading empires in history. Together, they probably had more money and bargaining power for their population size than almost any civilization I've covered on this channel before. Maybe Novgorod is the only one I can think of that would be a better example of this than the Swahilis. But on top of that, they were not just a middleman. They were peddling incredibly valuable goods that in many cases couldn't be found anywhere else in the world, or at least not cheaply. I went over those earlier, and I think I've beaten this topic to death enough. Just suffice to say, Swahilis equals rich. But for the second theme, we are looking at a beleaguered thalassocracy. The Swahilis held near total control of their little section of the Indian Ocean. Their navies were very formidable. It took massive Portuguese tall ships armed with heavy cannons to even come close to challenging them, and they were able to fight off the constant piracy from several major maritime powers very comfortably up until that point. That isn't to say that the pirates never got what they were looking for. Obviously, there were tons of pirates and raiders in the region, but the fact that they were able to hold their own despite all of this and still turn a massive profit is a perfect indication of just how navally competent these guys were. No one does well when they're being attacked on all sides, even when you're the richest nation in Africa. And lastly, the Swahili city-states were unified rivals. All of them, all 12 of them, were unified through language, namely Kiswahili, religion, namely Islam, and trade, because they all traded pretty much the same goods. But they very, very often fought each other, undermined each other, pointed the Portuguese at each other like Zanzibar did to Kilwa. I've mentioned many of the bigger Swahili city-states already, but just to go over the most important ones, you have Kilwa, Mombasa, and then Mogadishu. But beyond that, there were many other important ones. I believe there's about 12 total, including Kanbalu, which I mentioned earlier, Malindi, Songo Manara, and many besides, including Zanzibar. Though that's kind of cheating, because Zanzibar is an island that had several powerful city-states on it, though you can kind of combine them together for certain purposes, especially towards the end of the Swahili goal. Age. And with all that, we finally come to the end of the history section. If that was all you were here for, thank you so very much for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe before you go. And for all those of you who, like me, love Age of Empires and want to see what my build of the Swahili might look like in game, let's move on to the mechanics section, beginning with some necessary updates. The Swahilis include one unit that might be familiar to you, but I have made some substantial tweaks to, that being a regional building called the Caravan Sarai. Ever heard of it? I love it. It's one of my favorite additions from Dynasties of India, but it's silly that just the Hindustanis get it. Obviously, the Persians were the ones who initially invented the Caravan Sarai, though it's not like 
It's not like a breakthrough technology, like, oh, guys, wow, it's a big in that we fortify. Woo! But anyways, let's move on. My version of the Ketavansarai should look largely familiar to you, but there's a couple of key distinguishing factors. First of all, it takes longer to build, but otherwise, it's pretty much identical in terms of its numerical stats. However, its main selling point, its aura, has been adjusted. It has lower range, and it has lower heal rate and speed rate, but it applies to all units. This will be a way to heal up your army, reinforce to areas faster, very, very useful. And all of those benefits, including the aura range, are doubled for trade units. So you'll be getting this aura effect from much further away. It's going to be much more oomphy, and it will even hit your trade cogs. That being said, my version of the Keravansadai is more expensive, costing 125 wood, a little less, 125 gold, a good deal more, and the same 50 stone. Now, I think that the Ketavansadai should be gained by a bunch of civilizations. The Hindustanis, obviously, but also the Berbers, the Persians, for sure, the Saracens, and possibly even the Tatars. I was thinking of my civilizations, the Soninke and the Egyptians could also be included, as well as the Syrians, previously the Umayyads. Are there any other civilizations that you think deserve this building? If so, let me know down in the comments. Let's move on to an overview of the civilization. The Swahilis, a naval and gold civilization. Yes, gold. Gold is such a big focus for them, they get it in their civilization tags. Let's begin with their first civilization bonus. War galley and galleon upgrades are free. Woo, that's a strong water bonus. I should note, by the way, that you only get War Galley for free. You still have to research the combined technology to get Demo and Fire Ship. This is, of course, in reference to the fact that the Swahilis iterated naval warfare very, very rapidly and very effectively along the East African coast. This will obviously make the Swahilis a very strong contender on pretty much any water map, which is exactly as it should be. Second bonus, 10% of all resources collected are converted into gold. This is in reference to the fact that so much of the Swahili infrastructure was committed to cash crops that they often had to import food from the surrounding pastoral African peoples. They did farm for themselves, of course, this is why not all stuff is converted into gold, but it was a substantial enough percentage that they eventually were not able to sustain themselves on their own subsistence harvesting. This bonus is going to make the Swahilis have incredible endurance into the late game, but definitely screw up their earlier build patterns to some degree unless you can really plan your strategy around it. A very quirky bonus, and one that I could see really throwing a lot of people for a loop, but I think will be more upside than downside overall in the vast majority of situations. Third bonus, the trading commodity fee is reduced by 25%. This was the Saracen's former bonus. I stole it for the Egyptians, and then in my last recraft video, go take a look at that if you have not seen it yet, I actually removed this bonus outright from the Egyptians. Now the Swahilis get it, and boy is it justified. Trade, 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 trade. Masters of trade, you should know it by now, they did importing, they did exporting. Bob's your uncle, this bonus is a shoe-in for them. Fourth bonus, their sword line deals bonus damage to archers starting in Feudal Age, scaling up to plus four in Imperial Age. The Swahilis tended to field relatively small armies of elite soldiers, and they primarily focused on sword and shield style infantry. Many of the African peoples and pirates that they were often fighting against tended to focus more on ranged combat, like javelineers for the most part. And so this bonus, while not being like perfectly historically grounded, is kind of trying to reference the fact that Swahili militaries tended to be sword focused, and they often tended to be fighting long ranged factions. And since the sword line is usually really ass against archers, it's kind of a way of reconciling those two seemingly dissonant facts. Lastly, their team bonus is that villagers cost gold if you have insufficient food. So what does this mean? Let's say you only have 25 food, you click villager. That villager will then take all 25 of your remaining food plus 25 additional gold. Now, this bonus is going to be much more useful for the Swahilis than for their allies because they have 10% of their resources being converted into gold. It means that on a map like Islands, you might even be able to get away with having almost all of your economy 
on wood and gold, and none on farms. With a couple of fishing ships and the gold that you have to spare, you'll be able to keep producing villagers at a very, very healthy rate while sustaining your galley production. And it just allows them to be a lot more flexible in their build paths without having to worry about their gold conversion bonus screwing them over every single time. It will also give some, I'm sure, incremental advantage to their allies in many cases, especially early on if they're trying to do some interesting timing. I could see there being some really interesting strategies coming out of this bonus. Let's move on to their unique units. They have two, beginning with their castle unique unit, the Haramia. This is the Kiswahili word for pirate. It costs 60 food and 10 gold, and it is a fast, relatively squishy infantry unit. It's kind of like a Shotel warrior, but it has a fraction of the attack that a Shotel warrior has. It has a good rate of fire, but it's still doing like six damage per swing, which is really not gonna cut the mustard. That being said, it has a excellent attack bonus versus both eco units, villagers, trade cards, whatever, and buildings. So they're good at raiding. That high rate of fire will mean they'll get their bonus damage more often because they're taking more swings. And more importantly, they have a very useful ability. They can garrison in any friendly ship, even if that ship does not normally have the ability to transport units. You can only have five at maximum. For each Haramia inside of a friendly ship, it gains stacking attack and speed bonuses. And if that ship is sunk, all Haramia on board spawn on the nearest coastline. Now, obviously, this makes the Haramia a fantastic unit for any sort of naval map. Buff up your ships, get them close to the enemy base, fight, 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 and when they die, you have some free raiders. But that being said, they are also a fairly serviceable raiding unit even on land maps. Why? Because they are cheap, they're fast, they're good against villagers and buildings, and they benefit from both supplies and gambesons. And their elite upgrade does help out a little bit with their pierce armor. So they should be a very serviceable raiding unit that obviously is really, really good on any sort of water. Now, the second unique unit the Swahili have is the Mdepe. This costs 75 wood. It is an upgrade of the fishing ship that you can research in feudal for 150 food, 150 wood. Pretty expensive for feudal age. This makes the fishing ship a bit tougher and gives it a weak attack. And I do mean very weak. They'll be good against other fishing ships, but it will take like two or three to bring down a galley. That being said, they will get incrementally stronger per age for free. Again, not enough to hold a candle to a proper warship, but enough to be an annoyance. Additionally, whenever an Mdepe is brought back to be repaired by a villager, the villager will repair it to full with one swing of their hammer instantly, though it will cost as much as it normally would. This just makes the Mdepe a lot stickier and a lot better in those early feudal skirmishes where repairing a ship at shore can actually be the difference between winning and losing. So think of them largely as a defensive unique unit to help you out against early naval raids that eventually can enable your useless late game fishing fleet to do a little bit of damage before you just delete them all. On to their unique technologies. The Swahili Castle Age unique technology is called Husuni. This makes it such that certain buildings gain an aura, gaining a small amount of bonus armor to nearby friendly military units. Different buildings have different aura sizes, and all of them are small. A wall only has a one-tile aura size, whereas a castle or a town center has three, and that's the biggest one they have. But while this aura only gives plus one, plus one armor, it stacks up to threefold, meaning that if you position your units wisely, they're getting plus three, plus three armor. Wow, that's very, very impactful. You just have to be really good at positioning. This technology is deriving from the fact that Swahili towns were built for defense. They were attacked constantly and because of this, they literally laid out their towns to be these mazes, where street fighting was the MO rather than manning the walls. They'd let enemies in, hide inside of houses and get on roofs, and just pelt them with projectiles and jump out at them from around corners with swords drawn, and the enemies would not know where to go and would have a much worse idea of how many enemies there were and how to best combat them. And so this technology is trying to reference that street fighting style approach that the Swahilis took to defense. Lastly, their Imperial Age unique technology, Jeshi Sultani, makes it such that all elite units, namely non-siege, non-ship units that cost gold, have less non-gold cost and train faster based on how few land military units you control. Now, what does this mean? Let's say you have a champion. You want to train him and you don't have supplies research. Normally, it would cost 60 food, 20 gold. Let's say you have zero land military units for some reason. The champion would only cost 20 gold, minus 100% cost, and would train at double speed, plus 100% train time. But for each additional land military unit you had, those bonuses would both go down 
by one percent each. And so if you had 100 land military units, no benefits whatsoever. And again, this only applies to elite units, sword line, archer line, and a couple other units that we'll get into a little bit later, but not things like your mangonels. So where is this coming from? Well, Swahili city-states, as mentioned, fielded relatively small elite armies, which they were able to conscript very quickly by just paying skilled Arab mercenaries to fight for them. Jeshi Sultani roughly translates to Army of the Sultan in Kiswahili. I wish I'd been able to find a more thematic historical name for it, but this is the best I came to. And it should allow the Swahili to have a really interesting late game where they can convert from their boom to their military mass up very smoothly and effectively, while also being a little bit better at fighting on the back foot, complementing their Husuni technology, which makes them better at fighting in their own base. It also can make a difference on water maps. Once your ships have gained control of the ocean, it can be difficult to stomp out those last vestiges of the enemy, and this way you'll be able to mass up an army very quickly and effectively because it doesn't count ships, it's just land military units. So you can make that strong late game elite army really, really quickly, close out the game, and your ships won't interfere with it at all. As always, if you want any further details on any of these bonuses or technologies, check out the civilization document down in the description for more. Let's move on to an overview of their tech tree. Letter grades beginning with their infantry, it is a B. They do have the champion with that nice bonus versus archers. They have the Haramia, though that's kind of more of a naval bonus than an infantry one. And Jeshi Sultani will make a big difference for their champions late game, but they're missing halberdier and they also don't have arson, which isn't a huge deal. So they have serviceable infantry, just in general, I personally always think that Halberdier is more valuable than Champion, though looking at it in retrospect, perhaps a B plus would be a little more generous. Their Champions are very good, especially if you can get them on discount with Jeshi Sultani. They're archers, it's a B minus. They have the hand cannoneer, but they're missing a lot of other stuff. No arbalester, no elite skirmisher, ouch, and no ring archer armor. Though of course their hand cannoneers do benefit from Jeshi Sultani, and I guess their crossbowmen do as well, if you wanna do that. Cavalry, it's a C plus. They have the heavy camel. They have the elite battle elephant, and both of those benefit from Jeshi Sultani. But other than that, it's grim. They don't have Hussar. They don't have the whole night line like the Indian civs. They don't have bloodlines or plate barding armor. Eh, it's so bad. So pretty much the only time their cavalry is going to be really good is if you get to post imp, get Jeshi Sultani out, and can spam out ridiculously cheap fast training battle elephants with maybe some camel riders coming out to counter enemy paladins. You do have some interesting options here, and having battle elephants that cost no food hypothetically is very, very tempting. Just don't ever try to make cavalry until the late game unless you're specifically trying to trick or catch out your opponent with a weird scout rush. Siege. It's a B. They have siege engineers. And they actually have the armored elephant, though they are missing the siege elephant. And I should note, might be arbitrary, but armored elephants do benefit from Jeshi Sultani, though no other siege units do. I figured, now, they're an elephant more than they are siege. They cost food. It can count as an elite. Why the hell not? So they do benefit from Jeshi Sultani. So hypothetically, armored elephants that only cost gold, no food, if you don't have an army. <laughs> uh, so a bit of a trade-off. Overall, you have some interesting options. You have Siege Engineers. It's worthy of a B. Defenses. It's an A-. minus. The new Caravanserai is a very useful defensive building, and their Husuni unique technology is excellent on defense. Not to mention, Jeshi Sultani will tend to do better when you're on the back foot, which lends itself better to defensive situations. Add to that, you have a perfect university, and you're looking at a pretty solid defensive civilization. In fact, at one point, I even had this as a naval and defensive civilization instead of naval and gold. I just converted it later on because I preferred the playstyle that my current build iterated rather than the one I had previously. Economy. I'm calling it a B plus, but in my opinion, they have one of the weirdest economies in the game. They obviously have their very, very nice market bonus, access to the newly refurbished Caravanserai, and their two very strong bonuses surrounding gold. They have pretty much infinite gold late game, their villagers cost gold. Those are good things to have for your economy, but they are missing a bunch of late game eco technologies, and the gold conversion bonus might be a downside sometimes as well as an upside. So I kind of think you could argue anywhere from a B minus to an A minus with this one, but I felt B plus was the best compromise. On to levies. It's not looking good, guys. Oh, it's a D minus. They don't have Hal, they don't have Elite Skirm, they don't have Hussar, they don't have Ring Archer, Plate Barding Armor, Bloodlines. Oh, it's gross. It's awful. Though, hypothetically, all of their focus on gold with Jeshi Sultani and getting all that gold late game makes it such that levies are really 
not needed to the same degree. Hypothetically, they can counter any unit type just with the units that they have access to in Imperial. Their champions are good against archers, their hand cannoneers are good against infantry, their camel riders are good against cavalry, so you don't need levies, right? Still a D minus. <laughs> Doc, it's an A. They have a very strong navy. They have their Ntepe to help against feudal pressure. They have Haramia for raiding nonsense in Castle and Imperial Age. And they have a perfect Doc tech tree with that awesome free galley line upgrade bonus. I could see these guys being a contender for a top five, maybe even a top three water civilization in the game, especially because their economy is so good on water maps. Getting all that free gold and having their villagers be creatable by gold, meaning that you don't have to make farms, meaning that you can spend your wood on ships, it just, it just works together beautifully. I hope. Otherwise, I'd be a shitty designer, and we all know that's not the case, right? Right? Moving on. Monks. It's a C-. minus. They don't have redemption. They don't have atonement. Redemption is one of the most important technologies you can get out of the monastery, and they don't have any other benefit besides... Although I guess you could say, oh, they have all that gold to spend on monks. So they'll use monks for monk things, but they won't use them for the things that monks are really good at, like converting siege onagers. C minus, well deserved. Let's go on to an overview of their playstyle. How do I think a game featuring the Swahilis would actually play out in practice? Well, in the early game, you have a very good flexible eco. It's just a weird one. You have to manage it closely to make sure you're not getting overburdened on gold and you're spending gold on villagers wherever possible if you aren't using it for something else proactive. Once you get to Feudal Age, you have that awesome market. The Saracen market right now is one of their biggest strengths and the Swahilis will make great use of it as well. And best of all, it'll be even better for them than the Saracens because it will allow you to rebalance your economy if you're getting too bloated on gold, for example. You have an above average Drush and Archer Rush as the Swahilis as well. Your men at arms get plus one damage versus archers, which can make a difference early on. And that includes things like skirmishers, by the way. And your Archer Rush is very, very good because you have all that extra gold and you hypothetically can completely focus your economy around just cranking out archers without slowing down vill production. They also obviously have fantastic early water. If I'm going to do the Spirit of the Law thing and break the water grade into early and late, it's an A plus on water early. Free War Galley plus Ntepe plus their economy working so well with water. It's just a fantastic water start, and you might be able to close out the game before your opponent even hits Castle Age. On to the mid game. They have some pretty interesting flexible army options. Their crossbowmen are fully upgraded in Castle Age, their mangonels are serviceable, and you do have things like camel riders and battle elephants if you really need them. Though those two tend to be really good only once you have Jeshi Sultani in Imperial Age. Your unit quality really does start to drop. Your swordsmen are still very good, but once Castle Age ends, a lot of your units, like your crossbows and your camels and stuff like that, are just going to look weak in comparison to your opponents. You do also have the option to have a strong defensive boom. Husuni is very good for that, but Husuni also enables them to do some very rude castle dropping. Free armor on a castle drop is very nice, and especially if you can throw up some of the other buildings that Husuni gets benefits from around your castle, you can have a very, very sticky castle in place. Like, your builders are not going to get killed as easily while trying to repair it. And once you hit the late game as the Swahilis, the name of the game is Cheap Armies of Elites. You have champions, hand cannons, and your weird stable options all enabled by Jeshi Sultani to hypothetically be able to power through whatever chaff your opponent is chucking at you. You obviously have terrible levies and probably should never make them outside of a desperate need to counter specific enemy types, but your elites, like I mentioned earlier, can often cover the same niches. And your water play is still very, very good. Your Haramiya can enable some really cool raiding nonsense, you obviously get the free galley and stuff, but many of your bonuses on water are better early than they are late, so if their water early is an A+, their water late is an A-. Mostly generic, but they have the Haramiya and a couple other bonuses that push them out of the B range. And now that you have an idea of my Swahili build overall, let's move on to the loose threads. Some ideas that didn't quite make the build that I thought it would be remiss to not mention now. Let's begin with some uncertainties. Should they have elephant units? This one I'm not sure about, guys. Their tech tree was looking kind of sparse, and it is pretty well known that a lot of the African war elephants came from Eritrea and Somalia, which are close to the Swahili coast, like close enough that they totally could have imported them. 
I just could not find any historical evidence for this. It's entirely conjecture. I like it, I think it's pretty cool, but if anyone has a source saying definitively they didn't or they did, I would be more than happy to work with it. Second uncertainty is they feel a little weak to me, especially on land maps. I think that that gold conversion bonus on land maps specifically might be more of a downside than an upside. Again, I think it does really good things sometimes, but I guess more than them being weak, I think they might be very hard for new players to get into. Like, even more than usual for my shit, right? Uh, I don't think that all civilizations have to be accessible for new players, um, especially at a competitive level. Like, Age of Empires is such a fun game to just fuck around with, and you can do that with the Swahilis just fine. But it was an uncertainty, hence why it is in this section. Uh, and lastly, I was considering a whole new architecture set for this civilization, that being an Eastern architecture set. You'll, you'll see that the building that I showed there, Wonder, that looks completely different than the architecture set we have in the game right now. That's very Western African. And so an Eastern African set that could be used by them and the Ethiopians, I think it'd be really cool. I just didn't really know how merited it would be and didn't necessarily have the time to dive into African medieval architecture. But if any of you have thoughts on the topic, I'd love to hear from you. And if you'd perhaps like to contribute your time to researching this topic, please do hit me up. My email is public on the About tab of my channel if you are viewing on desktop and you can email me anytime. Tabled ideas. Some cool stuff I had that didn't make the build. First of all, sword line generate gold like a Keshek. Maybe even all infantry, maybe just the unique unit. This would obviously be in reference to piracy. The Swahilis did plenty of piracy, even though it was largely piracy being done to them. I felt like I had too much gold stuff going on at the point where I came up with this, and I liked the gold stuff I settled on more, as well as the current sword line bonus. Even if it's not as historical, it certainly does shore up a big weakness in their tech tree. Nextly, trading with the edge of the map. This would be kind of like my Swiss bonus where you can trade with town centers, but with even more implications. Guys, I'll be honest, I really like this one. I wanna explore this in future. And if anyone were to have it, it would be the trade empire that had goods spanning from Britain to China, yeah? But it felt like too much sauce for this one. Expect to see this in future at some point though. Nextly, the galley line getting bonus range. Not brilliantly historical, but yes, they were thalassocracy, good at fighting off pirates. Oh, Petru, I can shoot you further. It was just lame in comparison to the free galley upgrade bonus, I felt. Nextly, the market bonus scales with age. So instead of just being flat 25%, what if it went 20, 25, 30 in imperial age? Or what if the market reset for you when you advance in age? Both very cool ideas. I thought that the current Saracen bonus was a little bit cleaner, it's a lot more familiar, and I just removed it from the Egyptians, so may as well slide it right on to someone who deserves it even more. Next, as I mentioned earlier, I was strongly considering making these guys a defensive civilization with a more general defensive focus. I had some stuff like heated shot being free and maybe giving some other benefits, or even one where houses have bonus line of sight and have the current Husuni effect at base, so all your houses just gave nearby guys armor. Both cool ideas, especially the house one. I just felt like a defensive playstyle would be less interesting than the gold-focused playstyle that I ended up going with. Tell me if you think otherwise. I think naval and defensive is an underrated combo, though. Another one, a unique unit to do with local African levies. The Swahilis made plenty of use of local African peoples in war, even though their army tended to be those Arab elites. They had Africans come in and help them out all the time as well. But since I made this build so elite-focused with such garbage trash, it didn't really feel right to have their unique unit be a levy when so many other elements of the build contradict that. Uh, another unique unit idea, uh, a ship called a Zavra. This would be like a pirate ship that could maybe take slaves as it was sinking enemy ships. I like the Mtepe better. I think it has more interesting playstyle options available, but if I ever had to add a third unique unit, it would probably be this one. Uh, a unique building called a Boma. This was like a countryside estate, and it would be like an upgrade of a mill that would give some pop space, it would make nearby herd and bushes last longer, and would give you a free vill once you upgraded it, to reference like the master of the house coming into his own. Very cool idea, but I like the gold focus and I didn't want to give them too much to do with other resources like food. Another unique building, the Ngome. This would be a substitute for fortified wall. And while it would be a little bit weaker, it would have better line of sight and it would nerf enemy gather rate within line of sight. It's a weird bonus, isn't it? Well, the Ngome were the specific city walls used by many Swahili cities. And the gather rate reduction is in reference to how effectively the Swahili hegemonized the local African peoples. So I thought it was a cool way to exert some like pressure on your enemies in a kind of unconventional way. It just didn't feel quite as historical or synergistic as some of the other stuff I came to. Uh, a unique technology, got a couple of these, one called Merchant Marines, which would make it so that your eco ships gain a weak attack. 
Obviously, I kind of did the same thing with the Mtepe, but this was another route I considered going. I thought it could also be cool if your trade cogs and trade carts could gain attack through this technology. And I do like militarized trade units. I've done it plenty of times. I just had so much going on already that it didn't really feel like this could slot in. Another unique technology, laced boats. This was this really interesting building style for Swahili boats. It's what the Ntepe were known for, for example, where the planks of the ship were sewn together with thick ropes, which made them a little more flimsy, but very, very easy to repair and a lot more nimble in the water. And because of that, this unique technology would make ships repaired instantly, like what I have for the Ntepe right now, and also would be trained faster because laced boats were easier to build. You could also see them maybe getting a speed bonus. Cool idea, but I'm trying to avoid naval-only unique technologies, so this one went out the window for that. And lastly, Korite stonework. Swahili cities were very often made out of coral that was turned into carven stone blocks and sealed together with mortar. Gave them this very, very interesting look and was much cheaper than using quarried stone. And this technology would reference that by making it such that building stone cost is partially replaced with gold and buildings built near the water were built faster. Very cool, very defensive, very synergistic, but as I mentioned, I tried to avoid the defensive direction. If I were going in a defensive direction with this civilization, this would for sure be a unique technology for them. And with that, we come to the end. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the build. Before we leave off, let's take a look at the likelyometer. In my opinion, how likely is it that the Swahili's possibly looking something like the civilization design I have for them here will appear in Age of Empires II sometime in the future? And for the Swahili's, we have a 9 out of 10. Woo! That's one of the highest likelyometer grades in the history of the channel. I think the Swahili's are a shoe in. We are going to see more African countries down the line. You mark my frickin' words, guys. And I think of all them, the Swahili's are probably one of the top two best candidates. There's a good amount known about them. They feature an area that is almost completely unexplored by the game and still features in campaigns. They're connected to a lot of different civilizations, and I think they could play completely differently from anything else we see in the game now. But that's just what I think. Now I want to know what you think. How do you like my build? Did you learn anything new about Swahili history or African history in general? What would you have done differently? Do you think that I represented the history sufficiently with the design choices that I made? And lastly, what other Age of Empires 2 content would you like to see from me on this channel going forward? But until then, my name is Robbie Howell. And ciao for now.